This is VOA Africa. Hello, I'm Esther Githu Yowat. It's Tuesday, March 23rd. Welcome to Africa 54. We continue to work remotely because of the COVID-19 pandemic, but what hasn't changed is our commitment to bringing you the latest and most important news from the African continent and around the world. This is today's Africa 54. Tanzania continued its national mourning Tuesday of the late President John Magufuli with the people of Chato, his hometown, getting a chance to pay their last respects ahead of his burial on Thursday. Magufuli was mourned as a tireless champion of the cause of African progress at his funeral ceremony in the capital Dodoma on Monday. Sisi Posikweya reports. African leaders pay tribute to John Magufuli on Monday during a funeral ceremony for the Tanzanian president. Among them, Congo's president, Felix Tsisekedi, Kenya's Uhuru Kenyatta, and Zimbabwe's Emerson Nangagwa. South Africa's Cyril Ramaphosa delivered a eulogy. As the family of nations of Africa are today mourning the passing of their own an esteemed leader of his people and a tireless champion of the cause of African progress. Tanzania's new president, Samia Suluhu Hassan, joined thousands at a stadium in the capital, Dodoma, for the event. Last week, she announced that 61-year-old Magufuli had died from heart disease. Magufuli. That was after a more than two-week absence from public life which had fueled speculation that the vocal coronavirus skeptic had contracted COVID-19. Marco Fuli was Tanzania's first president to die in office. He will be buried later in the week in his home district. That was Sisipo Sikweya of Reuters reporting. The death toll from an armed attack on Niger's villages has soared to 137, according to the government. The coordinated raids on villages in southwestern Niger on Sunday make it one of the deadliest days in recent memory in a country ravaged by Islamist violence. The unidentified assailant struck in the afternoon, raiding three villages and other hamlets in Tahua region bordering Mali. In a statement, the government on Monday revised the toll up from a previous estimate by local authorities of about 60 killed. A dozen top United Nations officials on Monday called for a stop to indiscriminate and targeted attacks against civilians in Ethiopia's northern Tigray region. They particularly called out reports of rape and other horrific forms of sexual violence. In a joint statement, the officials, including UN aid chief Mark Lowcock, rights chief Michelle Bachelet, and refugee chief Filippo Grandi, called on the warring parties to protect civilians from human rights abuse condemn sexual violence and hold perpetrators accountable. Fighting between government troops and the region's former ruling party, the Tigray People's Liberation Front, has killed thousands of people and forced hundreds of thousands from their homes in the mountainous region of about 5 million. The UN Refugee Agency calls Burkina Faso the world's fastest growing displacement crisis with more than 1 million internally displaced people and counting. Among the displaced are some 140,000 disabled who struggle with discrimination, exploitation, and accessing aid. Henry Wilkins reports from Kaya, Burkina Faso. Disabled internally displaced people, or IDPs, suffer disproportionately in Burkina Faso's war with local bandits, jihadist groups, and other terrorists. Ratchidatu Mega and her mother, Adjaratu, fled the town of Arbinda almost two years ago. Yes, it's difficult because she can't walk. I have to carry her all the time. It is because of her that we fled here, in fact. When terrorists began killing people outside their house, Adjaratu was left with an impossible choice. Endanger the whole family and stay in the house, or run with the five children who could leaving Ratchid R2 behind. The day of the attack, we ran and left her in the house. We went back later after the attack. Thankfully, her daughter had survived the terrorist raid, 
but Adjuratu knew they couldn't stay in the town any longer. Ranchidatu says life has improved since they arrived in Kaya, a major humanitarian hub. Well, here is better because I'm healthy and I also get food. The leader of the host community where the Margas now live says he regularly sees IDPs with disabilities struggling more than others. I personally think it's good to support family members first because they are the ones who care for them ultimately. I am not only talking about money, but anything that can help them, like a trade. The UN Refugee Agency, UNHCR, says helping disabled IDPs get access to aid is a top priority. However, identifying people with disabilities is often difficult. We are especially focused on accessibility to services, how people living with a disability can get that little bit of extra help getting to services. There are also the issues of stigma and discrimination that we have to deal with, even with those providing the services or within the community. These are questions that must be addressed through raising awareness. He also says because the needs of the disabled are met by multiple UN agencies, this can make helping them more complicated. Nonetheless, many disabled IDPs show unusual resilience in the face of the conflict. Ludovic Kabore, whose name has been changed to protect his identity, stood up to terrorists who tried to mug him. Yes, I saw the terrorists. They stopped us and told us to run away. They tried to steal my phone. I told them, I'm not afraid of them. Henry Wilkins for VOA News, Kaya, Burkina Faso. From being Africa's newest female president to holding the second highest office in America to leading the World Trade Organization, black women are breaking barriers in various fields. Maria Magiello reports on recent and past history-making moments as the world celebrates women's achievements in March. It's been a history-making year for black women. Tanzania's Vice President Samia Suluhu Hassan became the country's first female president on March 19th, according to the Constitution, after the untimely death of its leader, John Magufuli, whose second term was to end in 2025. Some residents say they are optimistic. I feel so happy that we have a female president right now. She will help us support and empower us in some of our businesses, especially business owners, so that we can grow. In recent years, other African women have climbed to top positions. As of now, Africa has had 22 women, heads of state or heads of government meaning presidents or prime ministers, whether it's interim or acting or fully elected, uh, and coming from uh, uh, 15 African countries. This includes Liberian President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, Malawi's Joyce Banda, Ethiopia's Sahli Ward Zewde, the Central African Republic's Katerine Samba Panza, among others. Senegal has had two female prime ministers, and other African countries have had female vice presidents, including Gambia, Zambia, and Tanzania. Also making history in 2021, economist and former Nigerian government minister Ngozi Okonjo Iweyala. I'm very proud to be the first African. On March 1st, she became the first woman and the first African to hold the position of Director General at the World Trade Organization. Okonjo Iwayala said she is humbled and proud of her history-making role and plans to deliver results. I want to make sure that people remember my continent producing the first leader of the WTO that made a difference. Fellow Nigerian Koyo Toyo, a former member of parliament and former ambassador to Ethiopia and the African Union, says Okonjo Iwayala's role as WTO leader makes a strong statement. When you start opening up the room to the voices of women, you're also opening up the room to the voices of the many other people who are not being taken on board in terms of mainstream um, and thoughts around how capitalism, how the global economy has worked, how the systems of the world have been almost blind in terms of their understanding of the needs of certain parts, 
you know, so this inclusion is a huge step forward. And earlier this year, another history-making moment in the United States. I, Kamala Davy Harris, do solemnly swear. In January, Vice President Kamala Harris became the first African-American and first woman to hold the second highest office in the U.S. She attended Howard University in Washington, where Mohamed Salou Kamara leads the African Studies Department. America has finally reached this level where the Vice President of the United States is a black woman. And, and uh, a black woman who has also proven herself that I'm not here just because I'm black. I'm not here just because I'm a woman. Uh, I don't mean by just, you know, in a demeaning way, but it is to say, you know, she ran for president with a, a, a good stage of candidates. And she earned her own rights and respect to be picked as the running mate of the Democratic nominee. Harris is the daughter of an Indian mother and Jamaican father. It goes beyond African American. It goes into Asian American. Yes, it goes right. into Caribbean American. I believe Vice President Kamala Harris represents the true Pan-African and global African identity. It opens not just a door, but a gate for black women, black girls, but also Asian women and Asian girls. But Kamara says challenges remain as some countries appoint women to top positions that come with some influence, but no real power. Maria Magiello, VOA News, Washington. Scientists are still learning how the coronavirus affects the body and why it's so lethal. A Cleveland Clinic survey indicates more than half of those questioned didn't know how COVID-19 affects their hearts, and nearly 70% didn't know that high blood pressure also increases the risk if they get the virus. Viewers Carol Pearson has the details. One thing cardiologists know by now, people with heart problems have a higher risk for serious complications if they get COVID-19. Yet many people are unaware of this. Many people know that it affects the lungs, but it can also affect the heart, the pumping function of the heart, the clotting mechanisms in the blood. All of this put you to a very high risk of having cardiovascular problems. COVID can also damage healthy hearts, even if people don't show any symptoms. We see patients who have likely had viral infections that they didn't even recognize, and yet they manifest with heart failure symptoms months or years later. So there's, there could be a long-term implication to the health of patients who have been affected by COVID-19. Dr. Anderson says this is true even for some patients who had healthy hearts before getting the coronavirus. They had elevations of blood enzyme markers that were consistent with a heart attack, even though they didn't have any blockages in their coronary arteries. They had heart rhythm disturbances, and that this occurred with quite high prevalence. Emotional stress also plays a role, says Dr. Kapadia. People who have uh, fear, people who have uh, anger. Uh, it has been shown that both of these can lead to blood clotting mechanisms and can cause uh, heart attacks. Some of the heart damage doctors are seeing is reversible, but some is not, and it can lead to death. At the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio, researchers are testing an antibiotic and a medication for diabetes. They want to see if these drugs can prevent heart damage in COVID patients. Antibiotics fight bacterial infections. They don't work on viruses. But there are tiny bean-shaped parts inside our cells called mitochondria. Mitochondria generate chemical energy and drive many of our body's functions, including our heartbeat. Scientists believe that mitochondria evolved from a type of bacteria 
so an antibiotic might protect them from the coronavirus, and the mitochondria, in turn, would protect the heart. The diabetes drug being tested also helps mitochondria continue to produce energy. The researchers hope to start clinical trials with people who have recovered from the coronavirus so doctors can see if the volunteers' hearts continue to function well long after they have recovered from COVID-19. Carol Pearson, VOA News. As always, we're excited to hear what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Still to come, COVID-19 gives a boost to bike riding. We'll be right back. is about more than just sitting here and talking about women's issues. It's about listening to them and bringing their opinions to the table and making sure their voices are heard. Because our lived experiences, our stories, and our voices will help shape the next generation. Health, wellness, sport, beauty, medical breakthroughs. Healthy Living cares about your well-being. What are the main health concerns in Africa and around the world? Find out the latest on coronavirus. Connect with our experts and ask them questions. How long does the virus stay? Join me, Lino Mudu, in Washington every week on Healthy Living, right here on VOA. Welcome back to Africa 54. No us without you. Los Angeles nonprofit group has had its hands full for the past year, doing the charity work that many LA restaurants once helped provide, but could no longer because of being hit by the pandemic lockdowns. Angelina Bagdasarian has this story narrated by Anna Rice. For undocumented immigrants who have lost their jobs because of the pandemic, Boxes filled with vegetables, grains, and meats are often the only chance they have to get healthy food as they face a crisis. My life is filled with despair and fear. My husband lost two jobs and we don't qualify for any government aid. Merced came to California from Mexico some 20 years ago. But neither she nor her husband have documents allowing them to stay in the U.S. legally. Before the pandemic, she worked as a street vendor, but has since lost her job. Damian Diaz and also Nolasco have been helping people like Merced for the past year. The two men founded a nonprofit charity organization, Know Us Without You, in March 2020, when Los Angeles first issued a COVID-19 lockdown order. We put our money together and we started helping out 10 families with our own money. After that, it spread like wildfire, and I'm happy to say that 11 months later, we're helping over 1,600 families a week. Undocumented immigrants make up more than 10% of all restaurant workers, according to the Pew Research Center. Many pay taxes on their salaries, but do not qualify for government assistance. Diaz thinks that's unfair. But others believe that people living in the U.S. without proper documentation should not be entitled to the same benefits as citizens. We have enough uh, people in our country who are hurting, who are unemployed, uh, who, are, who don't have much to eat and can't pay their rent and pay their bills. Why should we reach out and help those that are invading our country? I think we should stop. An estimated 11 million people living in the U.S. do not have legal status, yet many work in jobs most Americans do not want. No somos criminales. 
We are not criminals, we are not murderers, we are people looking for a job. We came to this country looking for a safe life. To express her gratitude to the volunteers, Merced brings them hot lunches. No Us Without You helps about 7,000 people get essential goods every month. For Angelina Bagdasarian in Los Angeles, Anna Rice, VOA News. Since the deactivation of the Trump administration's Migrant Protection Protocol Program, also known as the Remain in Mexico policy, thousands of asylum seekers have been able to enter the U.S. to present their cases. Meantime, thousands of others have arrived at the border, also hoping to gain entry. Celia Mendoza reports from El Paso, Texas. Jose Raul Estrada Zavala, who lives in a camp in Ciudad Juarez, has been waiting for his turn to go to the U.S. In my case, I've waited for my process and it'll be what God wants. I'm one of the people who have never tried to cross illegally because I want to be in the United States and I want to have a work permit. His case and hundreds of others are now being handled differently after the Biden administration revoked the former administration's Remain in Mexico program. It's an approach that recognizes the need to address root causes of migration in a comprehensive manner over the long term, to also address challenges at our U.S. southern border, um, including changes to how we, um, how, how we conduct asylum. Since February, over 2,000 people that were blocked by the deactivated program have been able to enter the United States, according to official data provided by the International Organization for Migration. Meanwhile, the number of irregular crossings is increasing at the southern border. In February 2021, the Department of Homeland Security and the U.S. Border Patrol reported nearly 100,000 apprehensions, many of them unaccompanied minors. The numbers that I'm seeing right now are higher than we saw under 2019, higher than we saw uh, in any uh, other year. So I worry about those numbers because that leads me to believe that we are going to hit a crisis, uh, especially under COVID-19. Until now, the Biden administration has kept Title 42 active, an emergency measure imposed a year ago due to the pandemic, which prevents entry into the United States. But in Laredo, Texas, which is in the district that Congressman Cuellar represents, residents are alarmed by the influx. In our area, they released 10, I mean, they caught uh, 10,000 people in seven days, uh, 2,500 in just two days. So the numbers are increasing. And, and, and what concerns people is, is Border Patrol checking those folks for COVID-19? White House officials insist the border is closed to reduce the number of migrants risking their lives on a dangerous journey to the north, especially children. The Biden administration is also restarting a program to reunite minors with family members in the U.S. that was terminated by former President Trump. Now allow those people to actually have a legal way to arrive in the United States through the, the Central American Minors Program. And after this first phase of reviewing all of the previous uh, applications, we'll be do opening a second phase in the summer where we'll take new applications so that people have what the administration is focused on, a safe, secure, legal, and organized way and a humane way to, to arrive in the United States. All these changes are a noticeable shift from the immigration policies of the previous Trump administration. Celia Mendoza, VOA News, El Paso, Texas. Bike riding has soared in popularity over the past year. VOA's Faiza El Masri went to find out why more people are taking up cycling to get through the pandemic. Riding today is fantastic. It's not too hot, the sun's in your face, you've got the wind blowing, the smells cut grass and rolling by a barbecue shop and smelling that or cookies uh, it's crazy what you smell you know i started really young uh, probably gosh i don't know four years old or so uh, but i used to ride to work that was my transportation until i got a car for years and years the thing about being in a car is it, you're you disconnect yourself uh, you can't disconnect yourself on a bicycle in traffic. You can't. And you are no longer the top dog. And that's really important. I actually think 
that that feeling is important to help you make you a better driver because you're more aware of what's around you in the world. I love riding um, and I want to share that love. So I founded Maverick Charities to give back, to expand opportunity for other folks. We partner with organizations who help incarcerated folks who are coming out of incarceration get back on their feet and some of them can't have licenses. We're about to donate 50 bikes to Loudoun County Public Schools and that's our first run of 50. Uh, we plan on doing it frequently throughout the year, uh, at least twice a year. So I think what COVID-19 meant to cycling was an opportunity. Bicycling in the United States uh, has been increasing over the last decade or two in, in certain cities and places like Minneapolis, San Francisco, Portland, Washington, D.C. Bicycling has gotten an, an additional boost by a very unfortunate event, which is the, the COVID crisis. Um, many people found themselves uh, at home um, and in the need for physical activity and they were flocking to bikes often for recreational purposes. We have uh, uh, people who still go to work or have to make a trip, but are not comfortable making it on public transport anymore. The more people ride their bikes, the more likely drivers know cyclists who ride their bikes, the more likely drivers are cyclists themselves. And we are developing more of a, of a traffic culture that's watching out for the other, because the cyclist is not the unknown or the other. But it may be your friend or your work colleague, and you can sort of relate to the people who are, who are on bikes. So I think it's changing the, the traffic culture. About 40% of all trips that are taken a day are shorter than two miles. And so a trip is from one place, from your home to work, for example, is a trip, or from your work to uh, grabbing lunch. These are very bikeable distances. So there's a great potential, especially in cities, to move some of these trips away, away from cars. The more the community rides, the more the community will enjoy riding together. In the end, it brings us closer together. That's what bicycles do. They enable the world and they bring us closer together. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, we thank you for watching.